Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Teresa Huang, and I lead the Solutions Architecture team for startups in Canada. And with me today, I have Nick Hartman, who leads the Solutions Architecture team for startups for US Greenfield. So today, we're going to talk about mergers and acquisitions and how some of the AWS recommended practices and tooling can help startups either prepare or manage through an M&A transaction, whether as a buyer or a seller um, looking to be part of an acquisition. So first off, I'm going to um, set the stage by going through a high-level framework of the startup lifecycle. And the intent here is to identify areas for opportunities for uh, M&A transaction. And then very quickly, I'll go through the anatomy or different stages of an M&A transaction so that we could align on terminology and, uh, and the vernacular. And then for the majority of today's session, we're going to focus more on the technical due diligence and integration management aspects and talk about some of our recommended practices to help startups. And if we have time, maybe we'll talk a little bit about divestiture planning as well. So first off, before we get started, if I can see a show of hands, um, you know, who has been either a founder of a startup or been working as part of a startup? All right, so we, we got a, quite a number of you. So um, as, as some of you know, uh, when it comes to the uh, startup life cycle, there's about four or five stages that a startup goes through. I mean, first you start with an idea, or you've identified an opportunity in the marketplace for you to solve a problem that, um, you know, that could change the way people live or, or how things work. And when you have this idea, you, know, you want to make it more concrete by building your minimum viable product. Then your one job is to figure out whether or not this idea and this product has legs. And this is when you will be spending time and effort finding your product market fit. At this stage for the startup, typically you will be more interested and more concerned with acquiring users or customers as opposed to revenue. Your teams are, are um, you know, likely very small at this point. You may not prioritize things such as having a multi-account strategy or automation or you know, even in terms of global expansion. But once you've found your proof point of this product market fit, um, this is when startups typically start looking at opportunities for scaling. Um, in this stage, you might be um, looking to define a uh, you know, more definitive brand image out in the market. You might be looking to acquire customers at scale. And at this point, you're likely going to be focusing a little bit more on automation, about cost optimization, and all the great things that maybe uh, will make you more well-architected. And then, for some of the founders, you may be looking for an exit in the end, either through an IPO or an acquisition. So the acquisition um, as an exit strategy is a typically well-known uh, reason for an M&A transaction, but not the only one. Inorganic growth is uh, currently it's a good strategy for uh, successful startups, especially in the current economic uh, condition. So we are anticipating hearing and seeing more um, startups that are well-funded and well-run to you know, seek acquisition as your vehicle for expansion. And then one stage that we didn't really go through is the pivot. As startups realign their product strategy or, or their market strategy, they may decide to divest part or all of what they've developed um, so far to recoup some of the value that they've created. And if I may see a show of hands again, how many of you have been part of a transaction before? Okay, as a buyer or as a seller? Okay, some both, okay. So very quickly going through you know, some of the, the stages at very high level here um, of, of an M&A transaction. Um, on the sales side, as a seller, um, obviously when you start planning to sell, um, your point or, or your focus is to get your house in order, uh, be prepared for the valuation and due diligence process. And as a buyer, um, the most important thing is, of course, to figure out what your investment thesis is. What is the reason for you to acquire something? Um, I've talked to customers where they're a fintech and their point of acquiring a company is to get the banking license, in which case they have been very vocal and very candid to say that, you know what, we're just going to throw away all the tech. We just care about making sure that the people that come on board fit with the culture and skill sets that we're looking for. But the tech is not the focus. Um, I've also talked to companies where, you know, for them, they're buying a company with identical value proposition and product as what they have. 
And th what they're looking to do is to figure out the best of breed in terms of which part of the tech that they want to integrate into their um, current uh, structure and which ones to not. So your investment thesis will very much drive your, um, what you're looking for when it comes to the due diligence. And then obviously with the um, plan of integration management, there are varying degrees of integration as well depending on what your investment thesis is. So either as a buyer or as a seller, from a due diligence perspective, you know, it's, it's basically the same coin but opposite sides. And for today, we're gonna focus um, more on the pre-deal um, technical due diligence aspects as well as the post-deal integration management as opposed to the other areas of uh, an M&A transaction. So technical due diligence. Now, for those who are looking to be acquired, the value of what you have now is directly linked to how easy someone else can run in the future. And this is partially the reason for technical due diligence. Now the due diligence process is so that the buyer, before committing to a transaction, they can ensure they know what it is that they're buying, what obligations they are assuming, what technical debt they might be inheriting, and how much money it would take for them to you know, fix things if they need to, and what risk they might be exposed to. So it could be in the form of litigation risks, it could be intellectual property issues, and much more. Now, technical due diligence is just as important as the financial uh, due diligence, especially for buyers who are intending on integrating um, the seller's application or environment into their own. Now, as mentioned earlier with the examples, not all the acquirers and not all acquisitions care about the tech. But um, you know, sometimes the value of the acquisition is in the people, the customers, or, or you know, the business. And, but for today's talk, we're going to focus on those who do care about the tech. And historically, um, technical due diligence has been focused on identifying the risk and liabilities, um, especially pertaining to what the infrastructure shortcomings may pose from risk from a security and compliance perspective. But many of the traditional shortcomings or, or um, liabilities and gaps um, have been mitigated through cloud computing. So cloud computing has resolved a lot of the traditional gaps or issues that on-premises uh, infrastructure can face. And so when the buyer is looking to buy a company that is also on the cloud, they can instead seek to understand what the value, the value creation side of things, and what are the opportunities there, instead of just focus on the liabilities and the gaps. So as I mentioned earlier, the, the startup customer who bought another uh, digital asset company when I talked to them, they said that the actual technology that they're buying accounted for you know, 50% at least, um, where the tech synergy had a significant weight on their decision to buy. And you know, their, their assessment was that this company took a tech-first approach in building their product, and as a result, they were more entrepreneurial, and they could scale better. So that's definitely an area of opportunity that they were looking to as part of the um, investment thesis. So different areas where um, a company can prepare for um, the technical due diligence and be able to demonstrate not just risk mitigation but also value creation is in some of these areas. I mean, security, your security posture is definitely important uh, from a risk mitigation perspective. But how well your business technology and product strategy can pivot and align with changing market conditions, so your business agility, is definitely an area as well of consideration. And then when it comes to um, your IT infrastructure, your development automation, um, basically standardization to best practices, this is also an area where the, the TDD will look at. And of course, if you understand your cost drivers and you are effective in managing and optimizing your costs, cost effectiveness is definitely another area of value creation. Um, from a you know, process and um, operation um, procedures when it comes to staff uh, productivity, as well as operational resilience. These are different areas where the buyer will be looking at, especially from a culture perspective, if it want, and skill set, if you want to see whether or not the acquired company fits within your own post-integration, um, those are definitely areas of consideration. And scalability. Uh, we talked about um, acquisition as a vehicle for growth. In this case, uh, the possibility of global expansion is a, a key area from a value perspective of how the um, acquirer can gain more value uh, based on buying this company. 
So we will have Nick here joining us to uh, show us um, the, the how. So if your investment thesis is the what, and the TDD is the, um, you know, the how much and the what, um, how exactly would, um, would a company prepare for technical due diligence? Thank you, Teresa. So the next section of this talk, we're gonna go through some common things that will come up during technical due diligence. And as a company looking to be acquired or going through that process or preparing to go through that process, how you can best prepare so that it is as painless as possible. As Teresa mentioned earlier, the value of what you currently have is directly linked to the ease in which somebody else could run it. And also many other parameters there that we're gonna go through as well. And so uh, to get started here, we're gonna talk about operational efficiency and how you're actually running the operations. If you think about the company that is being acquired, there's the IP that the company has developed, the core product that differentiates it from other companies that potentially could be acquired. And then there's the underlying operational constructs of how that's actually run. And so one of the key themes that we really uh, look for our customers to do in this process is to make sure that your IP is great and your underlying ops are boring in the sense that you really want to avoid having not invented here thinking in terms of the overall design of how you're running the app. You know, if somebody is going to acquire your company, it's because of that IP. It's not because uh, you've developed some really new, interesting way to do CICD, unless, of course, that is your IP or your product. And so the more that you're following broadly adopted best practices in these areas, the more that you're not doing unconventional things that's going to trip up a technical due diligence or the ability of somebody else to run your product or services longer term, uh, that's going to translate into better value for your company longer term. So a lot of times as solution architects, we get asked, well, what does that mean? How do we know if we're following good practices? How do we know if the things that we're doing are following those broadly adopted uh, things that we should be looking to do? And so one of the great things that we have uh, to offer for customers is the well-architected review. So I'm going to take a few moments to just going through that and what the core components of that are. A well-architected review is something you could do your own, on your own, and I'll show you in a moment in the console where you can actually access that. But also, uh, your solution architect with your account team or an AWS partner uh, can also specialize in helping you work through this process. And this is a really fantastic preparation for technical due diligence. And essentially, you don't want the first time that you're really thinking about how am I running ops, how am I doing high availability, how have I addressed these security questions to be the actual technical due diligence process itself, because odds are you're going to find things where you have room for improvement. And so if you address those things proactively, then when you do the actual technical due diligence exercise, you're far less likely to be encountering these things, which again, could ultimately uh, potentially trip up the deal and translate into a lower value uh, for your company. So the well-architected uh, framework has six different pillars, which I'll cover here briefly. Uh, the first one is around operational excellence. This is really assessing how are you actually developing and deploying the infrastructure that you're, uh, that you're using. Are you deploying this through infrastructure as code or are you doing it manually through the console? How do you control access rights to the environment? How are you auditing who's doing what, where, and when? The second area is security. Uh, security is job zero for us at AWS, and it is for our customers as well. And so this is a core component of the well-architected review to make sure that you're covering all the appropriate bases and following best practices related to security. Reliability. Uh, making sure that your infrastructure is highly available, that it could tolerate a potential uh, service event in an availability zone or a network issue or some problem that would uh, cause a node in your uh, network or a device to go offline momentarily. Making sure that your app is able to scale on demand uh, and, and doing so with a high availability is a core thing that we look for in the reliability pillar. Performance efficiency. How are you appropriately scaling up and down? How are you uh, making sure that you have the lowest latency? You know, for example, if you have global users, are you using uh, things like CloudFront to make sure that you are putting that content in front of users with as low as latency as possible? So performance efficiency. Cost optimization. So we want to make sure that you are spending as little as possible uh, to develop and build the things that you are deploying and building for your customers. And from a technical due diligence standpoint, this again can directly translate back into value for your company. So if you take, for example, a SaaS company where every license you sell, maybe you're selling a license for $10, 
and currently the underlying AWS infrastructure required to service that $10 a month license is costing you $3 per month. Uh, but if you're able to cost optimize and take that $3 a month, say, down to $2 or $1.50 per month, that could significantly increase your margins on each of those transactions, which, of course, would translate into significantly higher value for your business. So cost optimization is definitely an area to get ahead of before you enter the technical due diligence. And the last area, which is recently added to the well-architected framework, is sustainability. And so sustainability is a top priority as well for AWS and Amazon as a whole, and increasingly it is for our customers as well. And so, for example, one recent study found that AWS infrastructure is 3.6 times more energy efficient than the median of US enterprise data centers that have been surveyed uh, across the nation. And AWS is currently on track to be 100% renewable power, gener uh, power for our data centers by 2025, which is five years ahead of our original goal of 2030. And we offer tools like the uh, AWS Carbon Footprint tool to help customers assess uh, the impact of the services that they're developing and deploying. And so to the extent that this comes up as part of the technical due diligence, which increasingly we're seeing these sorts of things materialize, um, we also have that as part of the well-architected review as well. So as I mentioned, the well-architected tool is something that you can run yourself uh, as a sort of self-assessment uh, guided through with the console. But we highly recommend as well that you consider uh, using your solution architect as part of your account team or enrolling an AWS partner, many of whom are specialized in running these uh, exercises with customers. And at the end of the day, the well-architected framework is designed to fuel a conversation about these different topics. It's not a prescriptive guidance that's going to say you should do it exactly this way or exactly that way, but rather very much like a technical due diligence process itself, it's going to go through and ask these questions, think about how you're addressing these different scenarios, and then fundamentally, as we talked about up front, are you doing that in a way that is broadly adopted and could be easily done by a potential acquirer, or have you made potentially unconventional decisions there, which might be a roadblock down, down the way, and now would be the time to address that before you get to the technical due diligence stage. In the next portion of the talk, we're gonna dive into a few of these areas in more detail and offer some uh, more prescriptive guidance in terms of uh, different areas and ways to address them. So first, we're gonna talk about security strategy. As we mentioned earlier, security is job zero for us at AWS, and it should be for you too. Um, the reality, though, is sometimes startups don't place quite as much emphasis on security as they should, uh, particularly early on, say, in the MVP phase and, and, or trying to acquire uh, product market fit. And it's quite common that during the technical due diligence, the acquiring company might have more rigorous or more uh, broader security standards than the acquiring company might have. And so the real key here is don't let that be a blocker during the technical due diligence process, because a bad security audit can and sometimes does absolutely foil a deal, especially, and we're gonna talk about regulated markets in a moment, but especially in a regulated market, Teresa mentioned banking earlier, you know, if a security audit uncovers really bad compliance controls, that could pretty much uh, kill the deal right there. And so we really wanna make sure that you're getting ahead of these things, uh, things like lease privilege, automation, logging and auditing, fragmented architecture, ideally a multi-account strategy, the sort of things that we would uncover in a well-architected review, uh, that you're ahead of those things before you get to the technical due diligence stage. And talking about um, security in the cloud, I'm gonna take a brief moment just to re-highlight here the shared responsibility model that everything operates under for AWS. And so in that shared responsibility model, we talk about the security of the cloud and the security in the cloud. So the security of the cloud, that's our responsibility at AWS. This is making sure that the underlying infrastructure, the physical facilities they run in, the backbone networking, and those sort of devices are secure. That's what we're responsible for delivering to you. You, as the customer, are responsible for the security in the cloud, the code that you write, the things that you deploy, the configurations that you set up. Um, these are things that are directly in your control. We're responsible for executing on them as you have provided them to us, but you're responsible, for example, to make sure that you configure a firewall rule or a security group in a way that is what you intend it to do. And so we give you a lot of security out of the box, but that does not absolve uh, you of the responsibility to make sure that you are securely building assets as well. One area that comes up a lot, and we talked about regulated industries earlier, are 
security and compliance controls and frameworks that apply to different regulated industries. So for example, here in the United States in healthcare, uh, HIPAA is a, is a significant um, uh, compliance control that applies uh, to that sector. And so one of the great things about building an AWS is that you're able to inherit global security and compliance controls through the use of different services. Um, so for example, uh, we have services that are what we call HIPAA compliant because if you build on them in a HIPAA compliant fashion, the underlying service will then be, uh, the, the underlying service is then also compliant. So this is important from a technical due diligence standpoint because you can then not worry so much about the infrastructure components of these areas. So for example, if you were running your own data center, then you would have to ensure that the physical access controls and things of that nature are compliant. By building in the cloud, you don't have to worry about that bit because that's the part of the shared responsibility model that we're responsible for. However, under that shared responsibility model, if you use a HIPAA compliant service, you still have to use the service in a way that itself is compliant with the appropriate uh, security standards and regulations. And so as part of that technical due diligence, really wanting to make sure that uh, how you're actually using the services is compliant as well. This is an area that sometimes we do see customers get tripped up on as they're building these uh, services where they say, well, I use this service and it says that it is HIPAA compliant, so therefore my underlying product should be HIPAA compliant. And that, again, that's not quite true. The service is compliant, but you have to build on it in a way. And so making sure that you've done that appropriate due diligence ahead of time is really important. Let me talk about a couple of quick tips here in terms of how to more broadly, um, how to more broadly identify where you have some opportunities for security improvements and aligning with security best practices. So one quick recommendation we would make is the AWS Security Hub, which collects security data from across AWS accounts and services and supported third-party products to help you analyze security trends and identify the highest priority security issues. And Security Hub automatically runs continuously account level configuration and security checks based on AWS best practices and industry standards and provides these checks as a readiness score that identifies the specific areas that you have that require additional attention. So again, there are no 100% right or wrong answers to a lot of these things like that would come up in a well-architected review, but Security Hub provides you some really solid baselines that you can form the basis of your security components of a technical due diligence. An acquiring company would definitely love to see that you've gone through these things proactively so you're not identifying them for the first time uh, during a security audit. Security Hub also provides integration with Amazon EventBridge, so that allows you to automate the remediation of specific findings that you might find. So for example, if there's a, a security group that's not configured in the way that you would like, you could automatically address that, and you could define custom actions for what happens when that's identified, including alerting or raising a ticket in a system that you might have, et cetera. So this is one of many uh, potential options that we definitely recommend looking at in terms of ensuring that you have a clear documented record of how you're actually securing your accounts in a way that would be uh, compatible with a eventual technical due diligence security audit. Another item uh, to consider would be conformance packs. Uh, and the AWS conformance packs are a collection of AWS config rules and remediation actions that can be easily deployed as a single entity in an account and a region or across an AWS organization in AWS uh, organizations. And these conformance packs are created through YAML files that contain a list of AWS config, manage, or custom rules or remediation actions. And you can deploy the template by using the AWS Config Console or the CLI. And so uh, there are some pre-configured uh, YAML templates. Many of them are available on GitHub um, for different, different situations that you might have. And so this is another area where you can take a documented set of best practices and then run that audit against your accounts to see how you align. And again, being able to proactively show that to a potential acquiring company would be very powerful in that technical due diligence scenario. So we've talked about security. Uh, next, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the overall governance strategy in terms of how you're actually running and deploying assets in your account. And so this comes down to things like the control plane, change management, infrastructure as code, et cetera. And one of the core take-home messages here is that you should really, as much as possible, automate everything. 
anything that you're doing that's not automated, if you're manually deploying something in the console or you're manually uh, doing migrations or code deployment, that all translates into more overhead and more overhead equals less net present value for your business. And so really as much as possible, identify anything that's not automated and automate it. And I talked to a customer yesterday, I think summed this up the best, where they were using a highly, uh, a, an architecture that was almost entirely based in serverless. And one of the reasons why they said they did that is because they wanted to make sure that their developers were spending as close as possible to 100% of their time developing IP that was specific to their company. They didn't want them developing code to deploy things. They didn't want them patching servers. They didn't want doing anything that wasn't directly linked to the IP of that company. So I think that's a really great thesis to take in mind as you're building these, uh, building out and preparing for a potential technical due diligence. So one way just to think about that, of course, would be uh, deploying as infrastructure as CICD. So codifying your infrastructure allows you to treat your infrastructure as code which then allows you to turn around and automate that uh, through a number of different tools. You can author your infrastructure as code in any code editor, uh, check it into a version control system, and then review those files with your team members before you, say, deploy it into production. Um, we have customers that use uh, CloudFormation, Terraform. So who, who here deploys things manually in the console? Quick show of hands. It's OK if you do. How about CloudFormation? All right, Terraform? Terraform, good. Yeah, so we have um, you know, lots of different ways that you could do this. And so uh, again, making sure that it's automated is not only good from an efficiency standpoint, but then also from an audit and security standpoint, so that you're not manually doing things where somebody could accidentally, say, make a change in production, um, which of course would not be good. And then broader in terms of the DevOps pipeline, also making sure that you are using automation and a seamless flow uh, through that as much as possible. This slide here shows what that looks like using AWS native services, but of course there are many other third party and partner products that you could integrate into these pipelines as well. Definitely recommend you visit the Expo uh, if you've not done so already, where you'll see many different options for uh, addressing components here from authoring of the original code to addressing source and artifacts, building and testing, deploying, and then monitoring as well in terms of taking through uh, logging from your different applications and analyzing them, et cetera. Next topic we want to talk about is around just overall operational robustness. And so again, there's a lot of analogies here with purchasing a house. If you purchase a house that you know, has good bones, as some like to say, uh, but needs the bathroom renovated and the plumbing is a bit rough around the edges and the electrical system needs to be replaced, you could probably sell the house, but it's going to sell at a significant discount. And so in terms of thinking about how you've structured the broader operations of your startup, that very much applies here too. Is this something someone's going to be able to buy and then instantly run on their own? Or are they going to have to invest a lot of time uh, to fix things up to their own standards? And so uh, one area uh, to think about here is how you've actually deployed your AWS infrastructure across, um, across your overall environment. For example, are you using multi-account strategy, which is currently how we would recommend that you, that you do so. Um, so for example, this is a somewhat generic example of a multi-account environment for a customer where you would have different environments for development and different workloads, et cetera, and that you would use things like AWS single sign-on to control access to all of these accounts. So you're not creating individual uh, login accounts for each, each underlying account. They're using service control policies to apply custom rules and, and compliance controls to each of these accounts, governing who can do what, where, and when that you leverage a central logging account to pick up cloud trail records so that as things are done across each of these accounts, you have an immutable record of what happened where and when. And so having a structured account, or having an overall organization structured in this way really would demonstrate to an acquiring company that you have thought about the operational robustness of your operation. You've put appropriate compliance controls in place to track who's doing what, where, and when. You have things like single sign-on with multi-factor authentication to control access to that. Um, and, 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 and so uh, there are many talks here at reInvent that go into this topic in much more detail. And so uh, you know, we're not going to go into too much more detail here, but definitely recommend diving into that further if, if, if your current infrastructure is not looking something remotely like what is currently on the screen. 
Uh, I talked earlier about using CloudTrail and having that continuous audit record uh, as part of your overall uh, infrastructure setup. And so that is uh, really important because you're going to want to be able to demonstrate that not only do you have tight controls in place, but then you have an immutable record to be able to show what actually happened where, when, and why, uh, which again, in a regulated environment is, is absolutely critical. Uh, but regardless of if that's actually required by regulation, it will certainly be something that will raise the bar from your technical standpoint for the acquiring company. Uh, for example, we recommend using AWS Audit Manager to map your compliance requirements to AWS usage data with pre-built custom frameworks and automated evidence collection. And so that avoids the need to manually collect, review, and manage evidence with automated evidence collection. Um, and this allows you to really then have that record of control in terms of who's doing what, where, when, and why. So we've talked a lot about infrastructure uh, in terms of security, how you're deploying things, um, the underlying uh, ability to automate as much as that as possible. I'm gonna take a few moments and talk about the actual IP side, the bit that ultimately is what the acquiring company is looking to buy, the thing, the product, the service, et cetera, the IP that you have developed. And so as part of that, there will be an intellectual property review during the technical due diligence. And one of the common things that will come up, and honestly is sometimes often overlooked, and I've seen it firsthand myself, is this question of, do you have the rights to use all of the IP that you have in your product? Now, if you ask any company that, they're almost certainly gonna say, yes, of course we do. Of course, you really wanna follow up and say, like, are you really sure, right? And this is something that I've personally seen uh, impact a number of deals where during the technical due diligence process, the acquiring company, if they are doing rigorous due diligence, will literally want to look at all of your code, including all of the other references and packages and open source things that you're including in there, and seeing, do you actually have the right, do you have the right licenses to use those other bits of intellectual property in the way you are? For example, are you able to commercially sell an offering that uses a particular set of code? There are lots of different nuanced licenses, and it's not uncommon for somebody to get tripped up where they may have incorporated a bit of IP into their product that it didn't 100% have the right to use in the way that it was used. And so you don't want this to happen or this to be uncovered during the technical due diligence. Uh, and the greatest example I, or comparison here that I would offer up is this is like a title search. If you've ever purchased a home, you don't wanna turn up to the closing table and find out that 30 years ago, there was a dispute about the land ownership, and this is suddenly going to be a big problem in terms of purchasing this house, because the house doesn't have a clean title. So in terms of the technical due diligence, this is kind of the same thing. You don't wanna be very far down the process and then uncover that actually there's a component that you don't fully have the rights to. Now, yes, that could be fixed. You could uh, negotiate with the IP owner, address the licensing concerns, or remove the dependency, uh, but that is potentially expensive. It could potentially foil the deal and definitely something to avoid. So don't wait until the point when this actually happens in the technical due diligence to go through these items. Make sure you get ahead of that ahead of time and that your product is good to go in that department. And again, it does surprise people. People don't often think about that. So, Last area I'm gonna kind of dive into here is really around cost controls. We talked about this earlier, uh, that we want to make sure that you're spending as little as possible in terms of what you're building for your customers. And this is, again, very important during the technical due diligence process. And I gave the example of a SaaS product earlier, where if you can reduce the cost per customer, even by a few percentage points, that is gonna have potentially significant impact on the value of your business because it can impact, directly impact your margins. And so, uh, regardless if you're getting ready to sell the company or not, you really wanna make sure that you understand what is driving your cost and what each component is doing and that you're comfortable with the value that that generates relative to its cost. And so, we're gonna go through a few examples here of, of how you can best do that, um, making sure that you're looking at the appropriate business metrics and what's actually happening and are you comfortable with that, making sure that you're uh, understanding the cost of all the underlying infrastructure. And then we're gonna go through some specific examples, uh, things that we consistently see that are often overlooked uh, where you can potentially generate some additional cost savings to again, drive the unit cost of your product down as far as possible. 
So optimizing your AWS bill, optimizing your costs overall, really comes down to a combination of what are you actually building and how are you using it, and then how are you actually uh, architecting that in terms of its optimization. Um, so we're going to go through a few specific examples uh, in a moment. Um, but in terms of understanding what actually is driving the costs, the number one tool that we offer for that, and definitely something you should be looking at on a weekly basis, is the uh, uh, AWS Cost Explorer. And so Cost Explorer allows you to see the spend of each of the different services across all of your accounts. If you have an organization, much like we saw on the slide earlier, you'll be able to roll up all of the expenditure into a single view by account and see uh, your spend in almost real time. There's a few hours delay before it appears in the dashboard. Be able to get an almost real time view of the cost. I would recommend that every customer, whoever's in charge of monitoring the spend, takes a moment to look at Cost Explorer at least once a week, if not even more. When I was in charge of infrastructure management at my last company, uh, I was looking at this on effectively a daily basis, and I was always uncovering opportunities where we could fine tune things and, and further optimize. And sometimes it boils down to things as simple as, do you have a development environment that has, say, some additional RDS servers that are being used, RDS instances that are being used by the developers uh, for databases? And do they go home on the weekends? And are they actually using those instances over the weekends? If you simply shut those down on a Friday afternoon and start them back up on a Monday morning, which is only going to take a few minutes, then you know, right there you're saving essentially two-sevenths of the cost of that infrastructure. And so the more that you really scrutinize this, you can find a lot of areas to really drive down those costs. And again, we want to make sure you're spending as little as is necessary to build that. In addition to what comes out of the box in Cost Explorer, another tip that we definitely recommend, especially in large, complex, and multi-account environments, is that you leverage cost allocation tags. So cost allocation tags, if you're not familiar, allows you to monitor costs relative to the infrastructure associated with specific tags. So if you're spinning up resources, you know that you can assign tags to that. They can be custom tags that you create, whether it be, say, the name of the product, uh, maybe the ID of the person who spun it up, what environment it's in, could be a cost center code. Um, you can specify those in general across all of your assets, but you can also leverage that for cost reporting. And so therefore, for example, you could say, what's the cost of production relative to development? What's the cost associated with this team versus another team? Quick side tip here, because this is often overlooked. Cost allocation tags need to be enabled separately uh, in the billing console for the main billing account for the organization. And so uh, when you go in there, you'll be able to see uh, the potential tags that you could enable for cost uh, reporting, and then you'll have to select that. It takes about 24 hours for that to then appear in Cost Explorer. So just point that out, because sometimes people are looking in Cost Explorer to find it, uh, but you have to find it in the billing console to enable it, and then the reporting will appear in Cost Explorer. So what about some specific things that we see people overlooking? Um, some of the most obvious things that, that uh, sometimes lead to additional spend would be things like uh, not using reserved instances and savings plans. I mean, this is sort of always the headline in terms of uh, driving down your AWS costs, but nonetheless, uh, we do see customers sometimes overlook that where they'll have a lot of on-demand instances. Savings plans are an excellent way to save on compute because you can, uh, you can without committing to specific, instance, uh, specific instances, you can have broad savings across whole instance families as opposed to having to reserve specific types of instances up front. Uh, using uh, other processor types. So for example, Graviton, Tranium, and Inferentia. Uh, these processors offer improved cost uh, compute performance relative to other infrastructure. So for example, Graviton can offer up to 40% uh, improvement over your uh, cost associated with other types of processors. So definitely make sure you're leveraging things like Graviton as much as possible, including with Lambda functions or in RDS instances where it's really just uh, selecting the different instance type that allows you to uh, run your code in those environments without having to do significant overhaul. Making sure you're leveraging serverless as much as possible. I referenced the customer earlier who said they're building primarily on serverless because it allows them to focus all of their developer time on net new IP as opposed to doing things that are not, uh, not necessarily core to their business. So things like Lambda uh, are definitely ways where you can uh, focus your developer time on that as opposed to building out custom load balancing and other integrations. 
making sure you're leveraging spot instances as much as possible for things like ML training jobs or other workloads that don't require the server to be on all of the time. If you have some fault tolerance, if, you, if, if that instance were to go away, definitely make sure you're leveraging spot because you can get 80, 90, sometimes even more percent savings uh, based on uh, the cost of those relative to on-demand EC2 instances. Make sure you're archiving unused EBS volumes. When we do cost optimization exercises with customers, this is something we often see, where somebody maybe had an EC2 instance, they turned that off, but they, or they terminated the instance, they wanted to retain the EBS volume for some reason, but maybe that was two years ago, and a 100 gigabyte EBS volume has just been sitting there untouched for the last two years. Um, you shouldn't really use EBS in that way in terms of creating an archive. Uh, if you really need to keep that data, you could archive it in S3, or really, if you don't need it, just delete it. Um, but don't keep a lot of old EBS volumes that aren't being actively used because it's a relatively expensive storage type relative to, say, uh, S3. Make sure you're optimizing your S3 storage tiers uh, so that you're not um, paying for a higher tier of service that you need for a particular use case. Uh, make sure you stop or archive unused RDS instances or Redshift instances. Uh, I talked about this earlier with the developers going home for the weekend. If they have a set of RDS instances that they're using and they're not using them over the weekend, turn them off over the weekend. Again, easy way to save additional cost. Make sure you're optimizing Amazon DynamoDB read-write capacity and anything else that has provision capacity. Uh, leverage all the monitoring. If you built out your infrastructure in the way we talked about earlier, you'll have really good monitoring to know what is actually a demand at different, different points in time. So make sure you don't over-provision these where you're paying for capacity that you're not using. Um, same thing goes for IOPS uh, back on EBS volumes where don't over-provision the IOPS if you don't actually need that many IOPS. You can always change it later if you need to. Um, make sure you're using endpoints. So a common example here, if you're making API queries to S3, uh, if you're not using an endpoint, you're making that query over an internet connection, and you're going to incur a bandwidth charge for doing that. But if you use an endpoint, you'll be able to leverage services like S3 without incurring those outgoing bandwidth charges. And that applies to a number of other services as well, as well as using things like private link to connect to other accounts. So for example, you might buy an API or a service on the marketplace, and you can use private link to be able to access that without going out over the internet and incurring those additional bandwidth charges. And lastly, and I'll give an example of this with Amazon Athena, make sure that each of the services you're using, you've appropriately architected it so that it is uh, you're using the service in the way that it was designed to be used, and you're not falling into an anti-pattern where you're going to run up a bill that is higher than would be uh, necessary to accomplish what you're trying to do. So for example, uh, with Athena, Athena is one of my favorite services. It is, uh, allows you to query data at rest in S3. So for example, you could have CSV files that you can query using SQL at rest in S3. It is billed based on how much data is scanned when you run a query. And the uh, details under the pricing model at the bottom there highlights the fact that uh, that data scanned includes whether or not the data has been compressed or not, and whether it is stored in a column or format like Amazon Parquet. And so if you didn't do those things, if you didn't compress it and you didn't store in column or format, say you have 100 gigabytes of data, uh, you're going to have to potentially scan through all 100 gigabytes of data in, terms, in order to run your query. But if you follow those best practices, instead of scanning 100 gigabytes and being billed for a 100 gigabyte query, uh, you may only have to scan a few hundred megabytes. And so following the outlined parameters in terms of how these services are billed is another way to make sure you're really minimizing um, the spend. And so both using Cost Explorer to identify where the spend is coming from, and then making sure referencing back to each of the services that you're not using them in an anti-pattern um, is, again, making sure that you're keeping that spend as small as necessary. Last area I'm going to talk about before handing back over to Teresa is just around people development. So we spent the whole talk up to this point really talking about the tech side of things. But of course, in most cases, there's going to be a team that is also acquired uh, in this process of uh, doing a merger and acquisition. Now, there's whole elements here related to culture and making sure that the culture fit between the two companies uh, is a good fit. And certainly no amount of technical due diligence would necessarily overcome a potential cultural mismatch between companies. Um, that's a whole topic for uh, another talk. 
But separate from the, from the cultural fit, just the technical skills of the people on the team uh, is really core to making sure that when the company is being acquired, is that team viewed as something that is going to raise the bar from the technical standards of the company? Or is it an area where they're going to look at that team and say, hey, they've managed to do, you know, run the company there as it is, but they may not be quite at the level that we're looking for in terms of where the existing company is at. So the number one advice here is basically make sure that you're the one raising the bar in that relationship uh, because that will, of course, make your company much more attractive if the people that you're bringing to the table are more technical or more skilled than, than those that are already at the existing company. We offer many ways uh, to continually upskill your team. So for example, we have training and certification. Many of our training programs are now free and available online. Um, solution architecture team, uh, our team, Teresa and team, spend a lot of time doing workshops with customers, immersion days, of course here at reInvent. There are many workshops where you get hands-on experience, making sure that you're taking advantage of those. Um, and if you would like to have things like custom workshops with your, uh, with your current team, like speak to your account manager, speak to your solution architect, these are things that can be customized and arranged for you. And also AWS certifications are a great way to document that your team has the specific expertise with AWS products and services. And these are things as well that can really help raise the bar in terms of that relationship uh, during the technical due diligence stage. So I'm going to turn things back over to Teresa now and say, we, let's say we've gone through the technical due diligence process and we've actually gone ahead with an acquisition. How do we actually do that in practice and, and close out the deal? So back to you, Teresa. Thanks, Nick. So integration management, I mean, first off, synergies. I'm also, I'm always a little bit embarrassed using the word synergies because it's a favorite word for buzzword lingo. And especially if you've grown up reading Dilbert as I have, it's almost seemed like a bad word. However, there is really little to no value for a company to go through the trouble of acquiring another company, if not for synergies, where the combined company's value really ought to be more than the sum of their separate efforts. That being said, 80% of transactions actually fail to realize the expected value. Now, well, the reason is not entirely tech all the time. Um, as Nick had said, in terms of cultural fit, uh, people on operating model uh, reasons, I personally have seen a merger where the differences in the two companies' culture uh, severely limited the value delivered. But nonetheless, 70% of acquirers do inherit uh, technical debt, that the complexity and complexity that they would need to entangle to realize the value. So from an integration planning perspective and road mapping of how you want to integrate really should happen much earlier in the process. As a buyer, you want to know beforehand how important it is to fully integrate what you've bought based on the reasons what you're buying anything at all. So that goes back to the investment thesis that we talked about a little bit earlier. So in the case with integration, you know, if you are acquiring a company as your vehicle for growth, um, you need to understand from an optionality perspective how you might want to treat this company that you've just acquired. You could possibly leave this company to run alone or with time and with effort, fully integrate the application and infrastructure into your own as well. And in that case, you would really need to understand, you know, what is the scope of this integration? What workload, what applications you might want to do the integration? When it comes to networking, security, you know, and operations, the different types of accounts, how you want to do so and when. Um, one of the companies that I've talked to, you know, they talked about the fact that, say, they have 10 AWS accounts, and what they've acquired also have 10 AWS accounts. The answer is not 20 AWS accounts in the end. So from an IT rationalization perspective, from a looking through each of the account and the value of the account perspective, those are all part of the integration planning. Meanwhile, I've talked to another company where the answer, not only was it not 20 AWS accounts, it was 21, because the... Um, uh, the, the structure that they were looking for was to leave the company alone, in which case you know, they had an extra account to manage both. So that being said, basically what we are talking about here is that the optionality of integration from a timing and from a scope perspective it should all be related to the investment thesis. And I'm actually gonna pass this back to Nick to talk about exactly how the integrations could occur. Sure, thanks Teresa. So, one of the things uh, that we like to highlight is that loosely coupled architectures empower the synergies and the integration that Teresa is talking about. And so the fundamental plan behind doing one of these acquisitions is that one plus one is equal to greater than something than two. And so uh, if we consider two monolithic architectures, we'll call them A and B here, 
if you're trying to say, if an acquiring company likes a portion of A, maybe there's a particular process or an API that's associated in there, and it wants to really leverage that as part of a synergy. Let's say it's a travel booking company, and there's an API in there that has hotel booking that's really of interest to the acquiring company. If it's a completely monolithic architecture, there's no real easy way to just scale up that component of the thing that was acquired. You'd have to keep deploying more and more of the monoliths in terms of being able to scale that. So that's not particularly efficient. It's not particularly cost effective. and any monolithic architecture like that at some point might just fall over on itself as well. And so we work a lot of times with startups where early on in the MVP phase, they may have built a largely monolithic architecture because it was easier, but they're gonna run into a point when that is much more difficult to scale, especially in an acquiring scenario where now that monolithic architecture could be much less attractive. And so if both sides, in this case, are using more of loosely connected architectures, now you could independently interface and scale with each of those different components. So let's say that hotel booking API that I was talking about, suddenly because of the acquisition, because of a synergy that develops, we're gonna increase the use of that API tenfold or a hundredfold. If we have a loosely connected architecture, we could independently scale that component of the overall application without having to deploy 10 or 100 times more, say, containers that are running the entire monolith. And so from an integration standpoint, and from, again, that technical due diligence and the post-deal integration, this is really key to making sure that we can actually realize those synergies, which, like Teresa was saying, oftentimes is a big struggle to actually see that happen in practice. So as I said, in this case, the airline booking destination city to a hotel suggestion service, that could be integrated much more easily through microservices versus a monolith. So let's say we've gone through with the acquisition and we have these different environments, ideally at a microservices or loosely connected architecture. How would we actually integrate some of these in practice? So for example, let's say we have uh, company A on the left where we have things like a Lambda function or an EC2 instance or maybe an ECS task. And then we have other things with the, acquire, with the other company, which could be another EC2 instance, Lambda jobs, et cetera. But we could use things like asynchronous uh, integration. So for example, the sender EC2 instance could put, uh, put, a object, put, put an entry into an SNS topic, which would then trigger a Lambda function so that we could have an ability, say, for an event in application A to trigger something happening in application B. We could also use an SQS queue uh, to be able to have a bit more of a lag time there so that we could build up a backlog if necessary, say in the middle case between an EC2 instance, uh, uh, sending EC2 instance and a receiving EC2 instance. Um, or we could use EventBridge to integrate, say, between two direct Lambda jobs and do so in an asynchronous fashion. Lastly, we could use something like the API Gateway if we wanted to have synchronous link between, say, two Lambda jobs. So lots of different ways to be able to integrate across um, these things, but primarily powered if we have that loosely connected architecture where, for example, we're using something like a Lambda job instead of a large monolithic application to integrate across uh, two things. What about if we acquire and we want to integrate uh, additional workloads into an existing organization? This is something that comes up where, say, the acquiring company, you have a uh, AWS organization. Now you've acquired, as Teresa said, a whole bunch of additional AWS accounts. Now we wouldn't recommend instantly putting that into your existing organization, applying all the service control policies, et cetera, because frankly, you might break some things if you're not following the same standards. So typically we would recommend that you would create a transitional organizational unit where you would put the acquired AWS accounts in there. You would do some additional auditing to understand how are the compliance controls that you would apply through something like a service control policy, how would that impact those accounts. And then once you're comfortable, then go ahead and apply that service control policy so that you don't inadvertently break a bunch of things um, by doing that without doing that testing first. What about networking? Uh, so you may have, uh, maybe the acquired company, you don't integrate things directly into the same direct organizational unit. Maybe they're, you're maintaining them as separate AWS accounts for now. Maybe there is on-prem infrastructure. Maybe there is uh, infrastructure in another cloud provider. How would you handle that scenario? So lots of different ways using peering connections. Uh, I definitely would highlight, for example, the transit gateway that we, would allow you to create network links between uh, different accounts in different AWS accounts, on-prem, 
other cloud providers, et cetera. So for example, you could use a direct peering connection, you could have a VPN connection, you could have a direct connect connection if you were connecting to on-prem facilities. There's a number of excellent networking talks here this week uh, if you really want to get into that in more detail. Uh, but there's a lot of options for being able to do that in terms of connecting the networking uh, between two different environments. And then what about data integration? You could use, for example, uh, AWS database migration service if you're trying to move data from an existing database instance into a database instance in the acquired environment. Or, or also, if you have, say, large quantities of flat files, you could use data sync to move between existing file systems and a data lake. A number of really exciting announcements in the keynote this morning around things like, for example, uh, using Aurora and integrating that data into Redshift. Um, so for example, let's say the, acquire, the company you've acquired has an Aurora database, being able to use a service like that to then dump that data into a Redshift database in your data lake without having to build a whole bunch of additional uh, ETL. So Teresa's gonna come back up. We're gonna summarize here uh, some take home messages and then we'll both be around for a few minutes afterwards uh, if we wanna address some uh, additional uh, follow up questions. So uh, Teresa, over to you. Right, so as mentioned earlier, the value of what you have is directly linked to how easily someone else can run in the future. So keep it, keep it simple. Yeah, also making sure you're not applying not invented here thinking to your design will, will make sure that you don't hurt uh, the value of your startup. Keep your IP great and make your ops boring. And as related to one, more overhead is not more value. It's the opposite, actually. So for your business, automate everything. Make sure that you remove any fixer up or discount to your business by uh, demonstrating that you're raising the bar around operational robustness in terms of how you're developing and deploying your infrastructure. And of course, know what your cost drivers are and optimize as much as you can. And last but not least, Using loosely connected architectures really empowers synergies and integration in an eventual acquisition scenario to make sure you're getting as much value out of that transaction as possible. This so, is, yeah, oh, sorry, yeah. No, thank you for attending this talk. There are a number of other talks um, this week uh, relating to um, mergers and acquisitions. Some of them dive a little bit deeper. And uh, please do uh, attend if this is a uh, topic of interest to you. Uh, please do attend the ones that we have here. And lastly, uh, this is only the second year that we've had this particular content. So we very much would welcome your feedback to help us uh, improve on this and any other topics that you guys want to um, hear in the future. Um, so please do uh, submit your feedback for this talk. So thank you very much for all of your attention. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your time at reInvent.